I'm Stephanie Scott, Communications and Outreach Director from Sponsored Projects Administration. We've heard from a representative of the libraries. We've heard the perspective of the biomedical researcher. And now you're about to hear the perspective of SPA. And I know when you hear the word spa, you're thinking of candles and massage oils and all that stuff. No, I'm talking about Sponsored Projects Administration, a.k.a. the Grants Office. And uh, people tend to have strong reactions when they hear about the Grants Office and Central Administration. But um, in hearing both your presentations today, um, I absolutely feel that we have shared goals and purpose with these uh, federal public access mandates. And I started writing down quotes such as smooth the path, at, smooth the path, and minimize administrative burden. And, um, and that really is it, is it, is how do we enable researcher success with these OSTP mandates? So going back to the memo that we referred to of, from February 2013, the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, every federal agency is implementing a public access plan for, for publications and for access to digital data. So how are universities going to support this? Uh, what have we learned from the NIH? public access policy um, and what are the questions that we should be asking ourselves in central offices now how can we collaborate with each other more um, and in particular well, what I'm going to say is that here at Columbia, we've been keeping our eyes open uh, for each of the federal agencies' rollout of their implementa implementation plans. And we're now at the point where some of these plans are starting to take effect. For example, NSF is about to roll out their plan and they're beginning a pilot project of their new da database to support the public access of publications. And we're having these conversations. So how do we support researchers? How do we ensure compliance? What is the university's role? And how can we encourage compliance as it relates to a researcher's career? So I think another important question is, how, why is this important to them? How can we communicate this to them? What is the incentive? Incentives, that was the other thing I quoted from you. <laughs> so, so let's talk about the key offices here. Um, who are involved with uh, discussing these mandates. And let's start talking about the key areas and the questions that we should be asking ourselves. First, let's talk about my office, SPA. So when you think about SPA, and I talked about the candles, and I talked about the oils, really we're <laughs> operational in nature. So um, we're a pre-award office with sometimes post-award responsibilities. We review proposals for compliance. Um, we are a service-oriented department, and our mission is to provide exceptional service. However, we don't have the expertise in dealing with publishers. Uh, we don't necessarily understand ourselves always the benefits of open access and public access. Um, I can tell you, you know, working in spa, I feel that there are times when I feel like I need to be better educated in the, better, uh, the benefits of open access so I can communicate it to faculty as it relates to compliance. And so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the working collaboratively together um, to ensure compliance and to also promote open access. Um, and and so, of course, we've heard from scholarly communication programs, uh, libraries, data management. Their focus is a little different from SPA because they're supporting the global reach and the impact of research. They're providing the tools, the data management plans, the increase of the awareness, and they really understand the benefits of open access. Um, and the libraries may provide system support and the tools to assist researchers in working with publishers and some of that hands-on help. Um, I also need to point out here, um, universities like Columbia and Harvard and some of the larger institutions are, are probably very lucky to have these resources, but smaller universities such as PUIs, predominantly undergraduate institutions, may not have these resources available to them. And so as other organizations are having these discussions, it becomes uh, 
who's going to take on what role. So uh, in continuing on, um, some universities may not have a copyright office or a copyright advisory officer. Uh, and these individuals, uh, and we do have one here at Columbia, they have experience in working with publishers, understanding the legal implementation implications of signing copyright agreements um, and can encourage faculty to be aware and be strategic in managing their copyrights. Um, and in this complex world of publishing um, and often what I find that can be a deterrent you know, a deterrent to compliance is that very often in my experience faculty or I'm sorry PIs and authors and working with publishers uh, may not um, read their copyright agreement fully and so um, and may not be able to communicate well with a publisher about the federal mandates that they have to comply with. And so all this work actually happens in the beginning with that author, with the publisher, in order to ensure its compliance. But I want to talk a little bit about that more later on in terms of the challenges. Uh, the Office of General Counsel may be involved in these discussions at your university in terms of uh, looking at language that could be negotiated to include in copyright agreements. Uh, to protect the university. Um, and then let's not also forget the provost or academic affairs and their role with university appointments and defining the expectations of faculty. They provide a role in this as well. Let's also not forget in uh, information technology, they may need to come to the table, especially when it comes to data security policies, personally identifiable information, HIPAA requirements, uh, and defining certain costs um, and central support that may need to be that may be needed for supporting data management in proposals. Um, and of course, human subject protections and IRB. Um, looking at the NIH um, genomic data sharing policy is a great prime example of where IRBs are now very much involved uh, with data sharing and ensuring that participants of a study uh, are well informed that their data may that their data may be used for future use for other types of studies. And so as you can see, I have nine offices listed here on the screen uh, that need to talk to each other about these public access mandates. And now let's talk about some of the areas and the questions that universities should and colleges should be asking themselves um, and how we're going to divvy up these roles and responsibilities. So who's going to stay on top of the sponsor policies themselves? And I actually have here, it's not just federal anymore. It's non-federal as well. Um, for those of you that may be in, uh, familiar with the Health Research Alliance, which is an alliance of nonprofit foundations, they are also mandating public access policies. So let's not forget that it's not just federal, it's non-federal as well. And who will take on the role of staying current with the non-uniform way in which uh, all of these agencies are um, mandating public access policies. So a big part of this is defining the role of who will stay current with the details of all these implementation plans and policies. And uh, then you have university policies. Who's going to revise and maintain university policies uh, and take on the role of of responsibility for um, keeping the institution compliant. Of course, communications, awareness, and training is a huge aspect of this with the research community. Uh, in my role in communications outreach, I've certainly done a lot of training for faculty, and I've learned so much over the years of uh, what works in terms of getting faculty to understand their responsibilities with this and what doesn't work. Uh, it's a very complex, and with my experience with the NIH public access policy, I can certainly tell you it's very complex complex to communicate it even in a succinct way. So this is, can be very challenging, um, but I've been very fortunate and happy to collaborate very closely with our libraries in doing this uh, type of training. Budgeting guidance. So um, let us not forget that I think not just sponsored projects offices um, but other offices as well should be talking about the types of costs. What are reasonable and customary 
reasonable costs that you would see in a project proposal to help support this. So publication costs, data management effort, data management um, or data managers, uh, and the allocation of supplies and equipment. And so these costs, you know, are allowable, but certainly with constrained funding, uh, if we have these mandates, and if, for example, uh, an investigator is applying for funding that may have a cap on total cost for requesting funding, uh, how do we fit this in? And if we can't fit it in a proposal budget to support it, where are those costs going to come from? So um, this is something else that we're talking about, as well as trying to come up with some centralized resources um, where we're talking with IT and talking with our data management experts about what these costs actually are. And so that folks like me in a spa office can communicate it and look at it when we're reviewing proposals to see what is reasonable. Uh, I know that in the very beginning we talked about uh, data management plans, uh, knowing where those resources knowing where those resources are and that they exist are extremely important and I know that in my office um, we communicate all the time with faculty and departments to point them to our libraries that have wonderful templates and guidance and the expertise to help develop these plans. But um, it also really comes up right up front as a faculty is developing their proposal. How do we get the word out to them that these resources are available? What are the first stop-gap measures before they even come to us to submit a proposal that these resources are out there. Uh, data sharing, of course. Um, repositories, security, uh, I mentioned that before. Human subjects consent for future use. Um, these are the other discussion points as we're moving forward. And monitoring and compliance. Um, some central offices and universities that I've talked to, uh, libraries have taken on part of a role to look at data, for example, with the NIH public access policy, to look at non-compliant publications and reach out to faculty. It's not always the library. Sometimes sponsored projects offices have been involved with this. And then sometimes faculty are on their own uh, to stay on top and be responsible for where their publications are in the compliance process. System support. So as each of the federal agencies are rolling out their plans, uh, as I said, you know, they're not uniform. Uh, we have NIH that has PubMed Central. We have now NSF and the Department of Energy working together on what's known as PAGES, uh, or the Public Access Repository. And so new systems are going to be popping up. Some are going to contract with NIH. Um, and who's going to be the subject matter experts in learning all these systems centrally? Uh, who's going to provide hands-on trading and do troubleshooting, developing training materials in learning these systems? Uh, ORCID IDs uh, and communicating that to faculty uh, to help them get registered even though it's a simple process. So. Um, Essentially, we're talking now also about system support. And I've done a little bit of this, uh, and our library certainly do, does a bit of this as well, where we have shared responsibilities. But again, you know, universities need to talk amongst themselves and kind of figure out what role we play with that. Uh, and as you can imagine, with the NIH, again, public access policy, they have my NCBI, they have the NIH manuscript system. Um, We've got PubMed and PubMed Central and differentiating what those two things are. We now have Science CV, which is another system that's pulling in publications to help create investigators' bio sketches. So systems are becoming more and more complex. And uh, this is one of my favorite bullets, actually, which is communications and communicating with publishers. Um, negotiating copyright agreements and communicating sponsor requirements to a publisher. Um, right now, you know, PIs and authors communicate directly with them. They may not know exactly how to communicate to them uh, to negotiate an appropriate copyright agreement to meet these mandates. Uh, so it's, it's very complex in terms of giving faculty the appropriate tools and the, I think, the ammunition to work with publishers. And 
And then in terms of support, uh, correcting noncompliance, which is something that I have been very involved with. Troubleshooting, assistance, providing education. Um, when we get to a noncompliant publication, for example, uh, and again, my experience with the NIH public access policy, it's already too late because, um, and let's not forget that with the NIH public access policy, if you have noncompliant publications, they will withhold and delay your future funding until they, the publications get fixed. And so actually looking at a noncompliant publication, figuring out why it's noncompliant, takes a lot of effort. And so universities have to talk about who's going to help support the faculty when we have noncompliance issues, because they can be quite tricky and complex to fix. In fact, there is no quick fix. Okay, oh, well there we go. See, I touched on some of these points already. Challenges so far uh, that we've experienced. Prevent, um, how can we educate faculty to prevent publication non-compliance because it really starts with the communications that take place between um, the authors and the publishers. If those talks don't happen right up front in terms of a sponsor's requirements and ensuring that the appropriate checks are boxed off in a copyright agreement, then you could get potential non-compliance down the road. Uh, and Increasing pressure to sign copyright agreements without reading fully what it says. Um, so, uh, especially possibly with junior faculty or those just starting out, they want to get published. And so there's tremendous pressure to sign these agreements to have that publication uh, out there. Uh, I talked. Here's another issue in terms of communications is that so much responsibility has put has been put on the PI to comply, they're also responsible for communicating with all potential authors on a grant. So grad students, postdocs, collaborators overseas, uh, subrecipients that may be publishing off of a PI's award, they have to comply with any publications that they write as well with the public access policy. But uh, they may forget or they may not be aware that they have these compliance obligations and it winds up being the PI's responsibility to communicate with all potential authors. But again, that's not necessarily their first priority with their research. Um, publication management, uh, the lack of ability to delegate the management and the administrative aspects of this has been quite a challenge. Um, so, and if it, I think it's difficult to have administrators be able to manage and associate, okay, these publications are related to these particular awards because they're not the scientists and they're not necessarily familiar with the outputs of the particular grant. Um, and so that has been a challenge so that, again, there's more responsibility on a principal investigator to comply because it's very difficult to delegate the administrative aspects of that uh, to other folks. Uh, and then finally, when you have these really large institutional training grants and multi-project grants, it could certainly get very hairy in terms of keeping track of compliance. And I know I'm talking a lot about publications uh, because that's where I've learned where a lot of the challenges are as opposed to uh, data sharing and data management. But I think there's also still so much offices like us in SPA that we are still learning concerning the challenges of data sharing and data management. So um, I don't know if this is the best graphic in the world. I got three big circles. I have sponsored projects administration on the top. And I have the scholarly communications program and the libraries over here. And everyone else I put in, in the nice purple circle. But I think really what the, the point I'm trying to make here is that we can't have any more silos. These public access mandates are so complex. Folks like myself need to be better educated uh, to be able to communicate to faculty in terms of how to comply. And we all need to, I think, learn from each other. I need to learn a little bit more about the roles of the library. I need to learn a little bit more about faculty's priorities. And then you, it would be helpful to also have libraries and faculty little, learn a little bit more about our role as well so that we can all support each other for reducing faculty administrative burden. 
So um, I think what's also difficult as faculty are looking for support for this is, as you can see from my nine offices, there's too many central offices to go to to get to uh, go for help. There isn't really one key individual that you could possibly go to to help you with all different aspects of this. So, uh, and I talked about educating each other. Better understanding, I think, of all of of our offices, that the benefits of open access uh, will foster better communication with faculty. And again, understanding what's important to faculty is extremely important for all of us so that we can advocate for them, which is my next slide and I think one of the most important slides. How can we advocate for faculty to reduce administrative burden? And so there are several professional organizations um, and I want to talk very, uh, just briefly about them. And I know the libraries also has professional organizations. And maybe this is the time where the chocolate me needs to meet the peanut butter. And we can work closely <laughs> with each other uh, to help advocate for our faculty. So there's the Federal Demonstration Partnership. Uh, just to give you um, a little bit about the Federal Demonstration Partnership. Uh, it is a cooperative initiative uh, consisting of 10 federal agencies, and I believe we have over 160 institutional recipients uh, institutions that are involved in the Federal Demonstration Partnership. This is where federal agencies and universities roll up their sleeves and they talk about how can we reduce administrative burden associated with federal research grants and contracts. And in 2012, the FDP conducted a survey of principal investigators of federally funded projects to determine the impact of federal regulations and requirements on the research process. And so they had over 13,000 PIs respond to this survey. They had a 26% response rate. Uh, this survey, the results of the survey, it's very interesting. You could go to thefdp.org. It is all there, the executive summary as well as the full report. And here's the key. Um, and I'm quoting here from the executive summary. PIs reported that almost half of their available research time for federal projects had to be allocated to project related requirements instead of the content of their research projects. Projects. PIs estimated an average of 42% of their research time associated with federally funded projects was spent on meeting requirements rather than conducting active research. Okay, this is very important, 42%. And in that 42%, and in that report, and I won't go into all the details of that report, they do talk about data sharing and how much time um, and is taken away uh, from their research in order to meet these responsibilities, including certain aspects of interpreting and adapting to changing federal requirements for data sharing, posting data and other resources such as software and curricula as required by federal funding agencies, clearing and posting publications to federal repositories, de-identifying and refining data to meet federal requirements for data sharing, and completing training regarding data sharing requirements on federal projects. And I won't talk too much more, but um, again, the goal is to try to reduce administrative burden. Partnerships like the Federal Demonstration Partnership is a great way to bring awareness to work with federal agencies in terms of possibly coming up with a demonstration pilot to collect more qualitative and quantitative data and the amount of time it may take to meet some of these federal mandates. And so I think now is the time to start working with some of our federal partners and collecting some of this information to do whatever we can to reduce the amount of systems available or the lack of uniformity so that we could better support researchers and have them conduct more research, you know, spend more time doing research. I also throw the other organizations up, such as the Council on Governmental Relations, uh, and CURA and SRA, uh, the Society of Research Administrators International, uh, which are also open forums for us to discuss uh, these issues together. So finally, uh, I'll just leave off. Um, this is the time for colleges and universities to form a central work group or task force talk about blended roles and key individuals who are going to share responsibilities and become aware of these different issues, train faculty jointly, do whatever we can to develop comprehensive but simple resources 
to help support faculty and let us all advocate together. So uh, I leave that as my final words and uh, I want to thank you very much. <laughs>